Now, Father, this is a very, very fascinating sermon today. It's a sermon about worship and why we should worship and praise you. And Father, it would be my heart's desire that you would give our congregation freedom this morning to tear that FOI card out of their bulletin and share with me how they think we could do a better job worshiping you. Father, I love you, and I thank you for this day. And I pray that you will use our church this year at the National Day of Prayer and Prayer in the Park to unite this community around the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and to lead this nation to repentance and to revival because of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Father, we're about to open our Bibles. And I pray, Father, that today, as we open our Bibles, that you would open our hearts and that you would open our minds. And Father, thank you that today one of our Acts 1-8 missionaries could be here with us today. Thank you for the chief. Thank you for Joanne. Thank you for David. Thank you for their ministry in Lebanon. Thank you that we get to pray for them every week. Lord, what a privilege it is always to have our missionaries come home. Thank you, Father, for this day. Open our hearts. Open our minds. As we open our Bibles, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue our series, Walking in Wisdom. Don't you love the cross? Well, that was really pitiful. Don't you love the cross? Very good. Very good. I'll accept it. Walking in wisdom. Today we're going to talk about praise and prevailing love. And our text is Mark chapter 14, verse 26, Psalms 117. Mark 14, 26 says, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now you and I believe that if we're going to walk in wisdom, we have to walk according to the light of God's word. And so that's what we're going to do today. Would you quote with me Psalms 119, 105 as we move forward in our service? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Now, I either went deaf or nobody else was uh, saying that with me. So let's try it again. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Very good. I had my hearing restored. Now, Jesus is walking in wisdom. And if we're going to walk in wisdom, we want to walk according to God's word, and we want to see what Jesus does as he's heading towards Gethsemane and then Calvary. And the Bible says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So just prior to Gethsemane and prior to Calvary, we find Jesus and the disciples singing Psalms 115, Psalms 116, Psalms 117 and 118. Now, I want you to picture this in your mind. Jesus has already been betrayed by Judas. Thirty pieces of silver have changed hands. In a few minutes, Jesus will be kissed by Judas and arrested. Shortly thereafter, Peter will deny him three times. All of the disciples will desert him. All of the people he healed will desert him. Then, the Romans will take him and put him on a cross and crucify him. We'll talk about that at our Good Friday Lord's Supper, and I hope that you're already uh, making plans to be here. And then, God the Father, for the first time in all of eternity, will separate him from his Son. And Jesus will say, on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For the first time in all of eternity, Jesus will experience the sins of the world. And while all of this is happening, 
What is Jesus doing just before these events? He's singing. Psalms 115, 116, 117, and 118. And so what this teaches me, above all else, is that if I'm going to walk in wisdom, I must fulfill God's will plan for my life. In only a few moments, Jesus is going to say, Put your sword away, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? He's going to say this. So if Jesus says, put your sword away, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? What he's saying to me is this. If I'm going to walk in wisdom, I must, I must, I must know God's will for my life and fulfill that will. And so as he walks out of the upper room, he begins to sing. One of the psalms that he'll sing is Psalms 117. It's the shortest psalm in the Psalter. It's the shortest chapter in the Bible. It only has 29 words in English, only three sentences. The writer is an anonymous writer, but the author, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Let's listen in as Jesus and the disciples sing Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. The word praise is the Hebrew verb hallel, from which we get hallelujah. Praise the Lord, all you nations. So every nation in the world is now called upon to praise the Lord. Extol him. All you peoples. Extol in the NIV is praise in the King James Version. It's actually a different Hebrew verb and it means loudly. Loudly. So this anonymous writer of Psalms 117 is calling upon all peoples, all nations, to praise the Lord and to do so loudly. Now as I thought about this psalm, it reminded me that first of all, he's calling us to be a people of praise, right? Praise the Lord and do it loudly. But not only is he calling upon us to praise the Lord loudly, this in its very essence is a missionary psalm. If you were to take your Bibles and you don't need to, but if you did, and you went to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, I would remind you of what God's call to Abraham was. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God was saying to the people of Israel, I want you to be a light that illuminates all of the world. All of the people that are lost in sin, I want you to illuminate them. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's a missionary hymn. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise the Lord, all peoples. Peoples would mean that in every nation there are different ethnic groups. If you came to my neighborhood that I grew up in, my neighborhood was all Italians and all Polish. And so all the peoples would be all the Italians and all the Polish in my neighborhood. All peoples, all nations, praising the Lord. It's a missionary hymn. Because God called the Hebrews, the Israelites, to bless the world by illuminating them and teaching them about the God of Israel. But it's also a unifying hymn. If you were to take your Bibles, and you looked in Romans 15, 11, you would see that the Apostle Paul is actually quoting Psalms 117, 1. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 15, 11. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to Him, all you people. 
If you read this in its context, the Apostle Paul said, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. Wouldn't that be the goal when we lead this city in the National Day of Prayer and Prayer in the Park? I mean, wouldn't it be our goal that in Cumberland Square Park, we have all of the people of Bristol, regardless of whether they're a Presbyterian, a Methodist, a Baptist, whatever, wouldn't it be our goal that all the denominations are coming together in Cumberland Square Park? We're all praising the Lord. We're all praying to the Lord. This is a unifying hymn. That's what this is about. And it's a hymn of great praise. Do you remember when Debbie Scott was here with the voice of the martyrs? Do you remember Debbie Scott led us in a hymn? Do you remember? It was fascinating. She said, I want all of us to sing together, I have decided to follow Jesus. Do you remember? But do you remember that we sang silently? Because Debbie reminded us that in the persecuted church, they can't sing out loud because then the authorities will hear them. Can you imagine what it would be like for a persecuted Christian to go to heaven and be able to praise the Lord loudly? What a phenomenal experience that would be. And yet we have that opportunity. I would like to ask you to take that tear-off section and fill it out and say, Pastor, here is one of my greatest worship experiences. Pastor, I think our worship could be better, more enhanced if we did this. Can I tell you my greatest worship experiences? My greatest worship experiences, one was in a cave in Israel, not far from the garden tomb. There was no worship leader. There were no instrumentalists. It was just a group of pastors singing Amazing Grace. It was one of my greatest worship experiences ever. When I was a teenager, I went to a camp called Word of Life in Scroon Lake, New York, not too far from Dr. Ray. And I can remember vividly being on this island, out on this big rock, up in the Adirondack Mountains, singing to the Lord. There were no instrumentalists. There was no worship leader. It was just a group of people praising the Lord. I remember when we built this building. I remember that there were these four walls. There was no ceiling and there was no floor except dirt. And I remember us standing there singing. I am standing on holy ground. Do you remember that moment? What a, you remember that, Chief? Remember that, Joanne? Remember that? What a phenomenal moment that was. There was no worship leader. There were no instrumentalists. It was just a group of people who had gathered with their heart to worship the Lord. And isn't that, isn't that what the Bible is calling us to do? Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol Him loudly, all you people. All nations, all ethnic groups, come together. Praise the Lord. Why in the world? Why in the world? Would we drop our denominational barriers? Why would we drop all of these barriers and come together and praise the Lord? What would be the pro Why would we do that? Well, that's the question that's about to be answered. If you look in Psalms 117, verse 2, he gives us the answer why we would do that. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord, he says. For great is his love toward us. Do you see that word great? It's the Hebrew adjective gabar. Great love. God's love is great. It is that which is greater, bigger in content, size, scope. It's a great love. Why? It's such a great love. That the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a great love. It is such a great love that it is sufficient for all 7.3 billion people on the planet. That's how great God's love is. Interesting story about uh, D.L. Moody and Henry Morehouse. Now, Henry Morehouse was an English preacher, and D.L. Moody was in England. And Moody, uh, probably uh, some, somewhat like you and me, he engaged in this conversation with Morehouse, and just off the cuff, to be polite. I mean, sometimes we say things to be polite. Moody said to Morehouse, he says, hey, if you're ever in Chicago, uh, you can preach in my church. He knew that he would never come to America. So he said, oh, it's good. Well, about six months later, he gets a telegram. And Morehouse says, uh, Moody, I'm in America. I'll be in Chicago on Sunday. So he says, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do now? So he said to his wife, look, I'm due to be out of town. I'm going to contact the church leaders. We're going to let Morehouse preach this Sunday morning only. You know, if he does okay, let him stay, preach Sunday night. Otherwise, just get rid of him. So Moody is gone for a whole week of services. He comes back and he says, uh, how'd that Morehouse do to his wife? And she said, well, he's a better preacher than you are. He said, what are you talking about? She said, well, he taught us that God loves sinners. And Moody says, God does not love sinners. She said, well, come and listen for yourself. She said, what do you mean? He said, she said, he's still preaching. What? Just a week later, he's still preaching? Yes. And by the way, he's only got one chat text, John 3.16. You mean he's been preaching all week, John 3.16? Absolutely. So Moody went that night, and he listened to Henry Morehouse. And Henry Morehouse, as he enters the pulpit, said, you know, I prayed about another text, but the only text I could think of was John 3.16. And D.L. Moody said it was that night, for the first time in his life, that he realized the greatness of God's love, that God loved sinners. Praise the Lord, all you people. Extol him, all you nations. Why? For great is his love toward us. Interestingly enough, though, that word great, that little Hebrew adjective, gabar, it not only means great, but in another sense it means a prevailing love, a prevailing love. So I'm going to ask you if you would to take your Bibles, if you want to, you don't have to. Sarah tells me I ask you to turn too much in your Bibles, and so if you want to, do it, if you don't, know. I want you to go to Genesis 7.18. It's a very interesting passage about the flood. The Bible says the waters rose, rose. That is the Hebrew adjective, gabar. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth. And all the mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose, gabar, and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. Now isn't that interesting? This is the word Gabar, yes, it's great, but here in this sense, it's prevailing. It covers the entire earth. To go to the tallest mountain, and the waters covered it, prevail. God's love, for great is his love, yes, in extent, it is sufficient for all 7.3 billion people on the planet. It's sufficient for all peoples and all nations. But it's not only great in extent, but God's love prevails over everything. Think of all of the mountainous obstacles in your life. Think of all of the mountains that are in your life today. You know what the psalmist is saying? Great is his love towards us, that God's love prevails over every single obstacle, if we will only let it. There's an interesting him. I don't know that I have ever sung it. But it's an interesting hymn that was transcribed in five minutes. Five minutes. A Scottish minister by the name of George Matheson. George Matheson says, 
that he was sitting in his home, his man's, his parsonage. The day was June 6, 1882. Listen to what he says. I was 40 years old. I was alone, and it was the night of my sister's marriage. And the rest of my family were staying overnight in Glasgow. Now, here's a sentence I want you to hear. Quote, something happened to me which was known only to myself, which caused me the most severe mental suffering. Here's a man. He's 40 years old. His sister has just been married. He's all alone. And he said, something happened that caused me the most severe mental suffering. Do you know what it was? I'll tell you what it was. Years before, George Matheson was engaged to his college sweetheart. They were to be married, but before they got married, George Matheson went to the doctor. And the doctor had some bad news for him. He said, Pastor Matheson, you, sir, are going blind, and you will be blind the rest of your life. And George Matheson went. To his college sweetheart, his fiance, told her that he was going to be blind. And she said, quote, I do not want to be married to a blind preacher. Period. End quote. Now fast forward in his life. He's alone in the manse. His sister has just gotten married. And he is reflecting back on the time. When he was told, I do not want to be married to a blind preacher. And he says, in five minutes, the Holy Spirit gave him the hymn, O oh, love that will not let me go. O oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul on thee. God's love is great in its extent. It covers all 7.3 billion people. But God's love is prevailing. No matter what is happening in your life, even if it is the greatest affliction, where your sweetheart says, I don't want to be married to a blind preacher, God's love prevails. Why is it that you and I should gather together and praise the Lord, all you nations? Extol Him, all you nations? Well, the Bible tells us. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. That word endures forever means perpetual. There is never an ending to God's faithfulness. The King James Version has the word truth. God's faithfulness or God's truth. Now, if you'd like to see a good, accurate definition of God's faithfulness or truth, you might turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 23. In Isaiah 22, 23, here's what we read. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. The words firm place are the words, same word, faithfulness, truth. It's the Hebrew word, amen. Did you know that amen is one of the only words found in every language on the planet? Only a few words are found in every language, and amen is one of them. And this is what amen means. It means to be driven like a nail into a firm place. So think of a nail. Think of a nail going into a piece of oak. It's firm. It's steady. That's what God's faithfulness is. That's God's truth. It is firm. It is reliable. It is unshakable. For great is his love towards us. And the faithfulness, the firmness, the unshakableness of the Lord is perpetual. It is unshakable. There was a pastor over in Kentucky. And he was so moved by the faithfulness of God 
that he wrote a hymn. Maybe you've heard of it. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thomas Chisholm died in 1960. But before Thomas died, he said this, quote, My income has never been large at any time due to impaired health in the earlier years which has followed me on until now. But I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care, which have been filled with astonishing faithfulness. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness. From a poor pastor, who had very, very little in life. But he said, God has always been faithful. Why should people gather together and praise the Lord? Why should we extol the Lord? For great is His love toward us. It is great in scope, in size, covering all 7.3 billion people. But it also prevails over all the mountainous problems that we have in life. And his love endures forever. And his faithfulness, his faithfulness, his truth, his stability, his unshakableness is perpetual. And the psalm ends. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I would just ask you, isn't that exactly what we read about when the very first church gathered together. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, such as should be saved. So what would be the connection then today between this message and you and me? Well, I think our connection would be threefold. First of all, this is a witnessing hymn. It is a missionary hymn. It's calling upon us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. To all peoples, to all nations. So let me encourage you on March 27th at 9.30 in the morning, when we gather together on Easter Sunday to invite your lost and unchurched friends at 9.30 to watch the Billy Graham DVD, My Hope with Billy Graham. But I would also ask you, because this is something that Gary and Jerry and I have been praying about. Wouldn't it be great if our church had a ministry to the Hispanics in our area, to the Orientals in our area, to the deaf in our area? Just think, if you knew a Christian in any of these groups, and if that Christian was willing to lead a Bible study, how fascinating would it be if while we're having a worship service, You had a group of deaf people over here singing with their sign language. Susie and I had that in our church in Florida. It was wonderful. Think if you had a group of Hispanics singing in their heart language. We had that in our church in Florida too. We had our congregation. We had the deaf. We had the Hispanics. All of us could come together and sing in our heart language. And we've got a lot of Orientals in our area. I don't know any who are born again Christians if you do. Why don't you reach out to them and say, would you consider starting a ministry in our church? Israel, in Genesis 12, 3, God said, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And you'll be a blessing to all the world. Unfortunately, Israel chose not to be an illuminating witness for Jesus. Instead, they chose to imitate the world. And so God now calls upon you and me, the church, to be the witness for Jesus. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. God wants us as a church to shine like stars. I'm asking you to help me. Take that FOI and say, Pastor, I think if we did this, if we maybe added this, if something else happened, We would be a more worshiping people. 
Maybe you want to share with me your great worship experiences I shared with you mine. Not only do we need to be a witnessing people, we need to be a worshiping people. Boy, we have our praise team. We have our instrumentalists. Some of you have great voices. Join the worship team. Some of you can play instruments. Add to our instrumentalists. Because the Bible calls us to hallel the Lord, extol the Lord, and to do it loudly. Did you know that we're going to be rather loud in heaven? Revelation 7, 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And if you're a Christian, you're invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19.1. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Verse 6, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. You and I are called upon to be worshipers. You're a chosen people, a royal priest of a holy nation, a people belonging to you. God, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Oh, I'm asking you, share with me your great worship experiences. I'll bet all of us who were here that night, when we had the walls, no floor, no ceiling. I bet every single one of us can go back in our mind singing, we are standing on holy ground. Give me your great worship experience. Tell me what you think would enhance our worship. And finally, let me just share with you. Not only are we to be a witnessing people and a worshiping people, we are to be a winning people. This is a hymn of prevailing love and faithfulness. Prevailing love. If you were to take your Bibles and go to Exodus 17, 11, you don't need to, but let me just share this verse with you. Exodus 17, 11. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. Winning. That's that Hebrew adjective, the bar. God wants us to be a winning people. We win by accepting the love of God. Isn't it a fact? That God's love prevailed at Calvary? Isn't that what Romans 5, 8 teaches? But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His love prevails over sinners. But I want to tell you, his love also prevails over sin. Romans 5, 20. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Here's a great tragedy. I have met so many Christians who a sin in the past keeps them from moving forward in the present. Oh my God. The love of God lets us win. At a place called Calvary, sinners are saved. And in Romans 5.20 it says that God's love is even greater than your sin. Ask Him to forgive you. And then thank Him. Romans 8, 38 and 39 tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's a winning strategy in life. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What if we began our day and lived our day believing in the love of an almighty God? Susie told me on the way to church today I had a rotten attitude. 
You know, we got to change our attitudes, don't we? Hello, hello. Don't we all have to change our attitudes from time to time? Yes. What if we let the love of God prevail in our life? That God's love, nothing can separate us from that love. And finally, is there anything, anything that could separate us from the faithfulness of God? Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. First Thessalonians 5.24 The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The hymn ends. Praise the Lord. And isn't that what Hebrews 13, 15 calls us to do? Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess His name. Why should you and I hallel the Lord, all nations? Why should you and I extol the Lord, all peoples? I'll tell you why. Because great is His love in extent, Great is his love in prevailing toward us. And the faithfulness, the steadiness, the reliability, the unchangeableness of God is perpetual. It never ends. Therefore, we are called upon to offer him sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips, praising and extolling the Lord. Two choices today. Where will you spend your eternal days? In heaven? It all depends on what you do with Jesus. And how will you live your earthly days? Remember when we began Psalm 115? Why are we called upon the glory in the Lord? Because of His love and His faithfulness. Now, why are we called to praise the Lord? Because of His love and His faithfulness. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you've given us. And as we prepare to sing this hymn of invitation, it's very possible that there's somebody here who has never experienced the love of God at Calvary. I would pray that today they would become a Christian. Come and take my hand and say, Pastor, I want to be a Christian. Father, there are some of us here who are Christians, but a sin in the past is not allowing the love of God to prevail in our life. We're just stuck. I pray, God, that we might come and find relief, either through praying with me or praying at our prayer altar. Some of us, God, have decisions to make in life, and we're weighing this option and that option, all of the different things. The truth is, God, we'll find that walking in wisdom is the safe place. Some of us, God, are questioning our future. If we put our future in your hands and trust it in your word, we would find that you are faithful, that you're firm, you're like a nail in an oak, steady and steady. Lord, all of us here, I imagine, have had experiences like me, whether it's in a cave in Israel, on a rock in New York, or here in the city of Bristol, on a dirt floor with no roof. And sometimes, Lord, it's the easiest thing for all of us to do, just to come and have a part of a service where we sing, but we don't worship. And Father, it would be my prayer that even today, some folks would be filling out that FOI card and saying, Pastor, I'd love to help you with John on our worship team and our instrumentals to make this the place of greatest and vibrant and final worship in our area. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness. Now you draw us to yourself, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. O soul, are you weary?